but uh, on the other hand, you may like it or not, he was a statesman. And if you read about politics in American books today, kissing or whatever, they, they don't uh, speak of him as a criminal, but as a statesman. I think it's accurate to say that few people in the world do view Hitler with such respect, perhaps partly because the Nuremberg prosecutor succeeded in picturing him not as a statesman, but as a criminal. Welcome back to Court TV's presentation of what can legitimately be called the trial of the century, the war crimes trial of Nazi leaders at Nuremberg now a half century ago. The American prosecutors devised an innovative technique to prove the charge that the Nazis had conspired to wage an aggressive and illegal war. The Americans used the Nazis' own newsreel footage to show various defendants with Hitler and with each other as the Nazis' expansionist plans were explained to the party faithful. Sixth Party Congress presented an excerpt from the official German film, Triumph of the Will, 4-10, September 1934. I extend greetings to the high representatives of foreign countries. The movement extends its greetings to the representatives of the armed forces, now under the command of the Führer. My Führer, around you are placed the flags and banners of this National Socialist. When their cloth will have become decayed, the people will understand what you, my Führer, mean to Germany. You are German. When you act, the nation acts. When you judge, the people judge. Thanks to your leadership, Germany will achieve its goal of being a homeland for all Germans throughout the world. You are our guarantee of victory. You are our guarantee of peace. Sie sind Deutschland. Wenn Sie handeln, handelt die Nation. Wenn Sie richten, richtet das Volk. Unser Dank ist das Gelöbnis, in guten und in bösen Tagen zu Ihnen zu stehen. Komme, was da wolle. Dank Ihrer Führung wird Deutschland sein Ziel erreichen, Heimat zu sein. Heimat zu sein für alle Deutschen der Welt. Sie waren uns der Garant des Sieges. Sie sind uns der Garant des Friedens. Das ist unser unerschütterlicher Glaube an uns selbst. 
such as our unshakable belief in ourselves, to continue the work which was founded during the stormy years of the revolt of 1918 in Munich, and which is embodied today in world historical significance by the entire German nation. Denn die Wahrheit ist das Fundament, mit dem die Macht der Presse steht und fällt. That the truth about Germany be reported, that is the only demand we make of the foreign press. Die wir an die Presse auch des Auslandes stellen. A people which disregards the purity of its race will perish. Geht zu Grunde! All our work must be governed by a single thought, that of making the German worker an upright and proud member of the people. I can only say as leader of German law instruction that our highest leader is also our highest judge. National socialistic justice is the foundation of the National Socialistic State. It should be pointed out here that there is a reason why the uh, pictures that you're seeing here on your screen are so atypical of what you normally see on court TV. You normally see courtroom scenes, and you will see that as we continue our coverage, particularly tomorrow, the next day, and ending on Friday of the Nuremberg trial. But these uh, films were used as part of the prosecution, and you'll later see the people you just saw in the films. You'll see them in the dock, and you'll see them pleading their case and attempting to answer some of this. Now, I do want to ask Walter Rockler, who has gone on record here unequivocally as not liking this uh, conspiracy charge, charge one, but you think that maybe tactically it served at least the purpose of preventing the defendants from demanding to be tried separately. Yes, because you could argue on behalf of some defendants who are not implicated in one count or another that the evidence being introduced was prejudicial to them. When you tie them all together as conspirators, anything is, is useful against anybody. Now, I want you to just say a word here about Otto Kranzbuehler. He is the German uh, attorney that we've quoted here several times. He is still alive. We went out and we interviewed him. He was an attorney. He was one of the most ex successful defense attorneys in this trial. He represented uh, Admiral Carl Dunitz, got him off the conspiracy trial, got him a 10-year uh, uh, sentence, pretty good. Uh, he is pretty brilliant, uh, seems to be fairly unreconstructed. I would say he's not reconstructed at all, and yeah. 50 years hasn't made much difference. <laughs> he certainly was very bright, yeah. uh, very f emphatic, very articulate, mm -hmm. and he still seems to be all of those things. Yeah. But I think basically he has a certain fundamental weakness. He remains a Nazi. <laughs> now, his argument was brilliant. The judges in this case had ruled that they would not pre permit the defense of, but you did it too. In other words, the Germans couldn't say. All the stuff we're accused of doing, uh, bombing civilian populations, uh, uh, things such as that, you did that too, and that's our defense. That was not permitted. But Otto uh, Kronzbuehler, who we've seen here, is obviously a very shrewd man. For Admiral Dunitz, he came up with a defense that, in fact, the Americans and the Germans were both doing illegal things in naval warfare, and thus they did the same thing. And he, he had Admiral Nimitz give testimony on his side. Yeah. Well, he gave it a new twist. Well, he, he gave he, it. He, he wasn't arguing took his deposition. what yeah. we got yeah. called the two quoque argument. Yeah. Yeah. He was arguing that by virtue of the fact that nobody observed certain rules, the rules had ceased to exist. There were no such rules anymore. Well, Admiral Therefore, Dunitz. It wasn't that we've done it and you've done it. It is that there's no longer a rule that yeah. guides, guides conduct. Well, sure, Admiral Dunitz uh, had devised the wolf pack strategy of submarine warfare, and that was illegal under perhaps classical rules, but the point, and he, and he got uh, Admiral Nimitz to say in his deposition, look, submarine warfare had developed to the, to the point that you did attack without warning, and if you were afraid you were going to be sunk, 
uh, you did not surface to save the survivors of the sunken ship? I think that's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, he had a, no oh yes, uh, I pr I, there probably could have been some argument, well they, c they probably couldn't make the argument then about the bombing of cities. The, we did indeed bomb Dresden and we bombed other civilian populations. Well there we recognize the merits of the same argument. Mm -hmm. If it's done by the Germans, done by the British, mm -hmm. done by the Americans, and in lesser degree done by the Soviets, what rule guides conduct? Uh, and that plagues us still. It's not clear uh, what the restrictions on bombing are today. But at least uh, to the extent of a change in submarine warfare, it was permitted uh, to argue that, look, submarine warfare has changed. We did certain things that classically were not permitted. So did the Americans. We'll take a break and resume our look at the Nazi plan presented in Nuremberg as a criminal conspiracy. One of the weaknesses of the charge that the Nazis conspired to wage an aggressive war was that many of the steps that Hitler and his underlings took were not criminal at the time they took them. Some said this made the conspiracy charge an ex post facto crime, that is, an offense created after the fact. In fact, several of the defendants, as we've discussed here, were found not guilty of this conspiracy charge. As the prosecution continues to play newsreel footage of the defendants discussing their plans for conquest, it is possible to see how some of them could argue that their actions were not criminal at that time. During an out rearmament of Germany, March 1935. Today, the rebuilt German National Guard rises again on the strong foundation of the National Socialistic Ideology. The Führer has wrought into one the parties, the classes, property, and religions. He has given us back our arms because he loves his people, and the security of Germany is close to his heart. Congress. Adolf Hitler pleads for the return of Mamel, then for the enactment of laws to be read by the President of the Reichstag. of the Reich is only that person who is of German or of the same kind of blood and who proves by his behavior that he is willing and has sworn to serve the German people and the Reich faithfully. Marriages between Jews and German citizens or persons of the same kind of blood are hereby prohibited. Now, it's notable as the prosecutors continued to play newsreels shot by the Nazis themselves way back, some of it in the late 1920s, in the early 1930s, that they were careful to include the beginning emergence of the virulent anti-Semitism that uh, finally uh, developed into the Holocaust that was such a terrible uh, product of this war. Now, I want to ask uh, Walter Rockler, uh, since the conspiracy charge really did not address the anti-Semitism specifically, what's the purpose here? Is it an attempt to show that the aggressive war they were trying to uh, prove that the, the Nazis were uh, developing here kind of inevitably was going to end up 
in a Holocaust? No, I think they uh, took the position, uh, which is illustrated in an old story about dogs. Uh, you kick a dog, the dog snarls and bites you, and you say, that's a very savage dog. Mm -hmm. uh, they argued at some length that uh, the, the Jews were going to cause Germany to go to war, uh, mm -hmm. that they were going to incite a war against Germany, and they were very hostile to the German population. And therefore, as part of their own preparations, it was necessary to say, well, we have to do something about this. We have to punish the Jews. Mm -hmm. um, it was linked, although not all that directly. Mm -hmm. One of the things that happened was when they played in the early part, when they played some of the newsreels, pictures of these terrible scenes in concentration camps, uh, one person in the courtroom, one woman who was a spectator, fainted. Uh, people wept, people looked away. Some of the defendants looked away. One turned his back as if to Shocked. show that, yeah, that he had nothing to do with it. Herman, uh, uh, Herman Goering yawned. Now, he seems to have uh, uh, been, in many ways, a kind of a unique character here. Despite the sort of, of evil that you see in this sort of, of uh, he, was, he was so much a Nazi, uh, he, 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 he was a dominant figure in this trial, wasn't he? He was probably the single dominant defendant, and he was personally very bright. Mm -hmm. I would say nobody would ever accuse him of great sensitivity. Yeah. Uh, do you believe that uh, some of that, the story goes around that he became in some sort of perverse ways popular because of his intelligence and uh, his uh, bravado? Do you believe that perhaps some of the American uh, guards knowingly helped him to commit suicide? Yes. Bear in mind that he had a, a record as a uh, distinguished pilot in World War I. Mm -hmm. He was a German hero to begin with. He was an ace. He shot down 22 yeah. planes. Yeah. So he, he didn't start out at any great disadvantage. Uh, people who knew him, and I was not one of them, and I particularly would not seek him, uh, thought that he had a certain amount of charm beneath the this rather savage and uh, coarse mm -hmm. conduct that he was capable of. Do, do you agree with those who feel that he, he said before this trial started that uh, he did not fear it, did not regret it, because he, they were going to make statements, they, all of them, he said to his fellow defendants, that would be read uh, 200 years with great admiration. Do you agree with those who feel that Justice Jackson, in cross-examining him, uh, really uh, blew it, in a sense, by permitting him to make the kind of statement that he did. It wasn't Jackson who permitted him to do that. It was the chief judge of the court, mm -hmm. Jeffrey Lawrence, who opened the door and took the position that uh, almost anything that a defendant wanted to say was permissible. Mm -hmm. Jackson and would have confined the uh, responses. In fact, Jackson, <coughs> I think, showed a certain amount of exasperation yeah. at the ranging comments that Goering was I making. See. And so what you're saying is that the judge probably would have permitted the others to do it, but Goering was smart enough and cunning enough to do it. He was playing for history. Okay. He, was, he was trying to create an image for, uh, in which the Germans would continue to admire him if they did, okay. forgetting the fact that Germany had been almost totally destroyed and my, nine million Germans were dead as a result of the Nazi party. Until he got to say his piece. As we go to a break, we'll hear from the man primarily responsible for collecting the evidence in an ongoing war crimes prosecution, that of crimes committed in the fighting in the former Yugoslavia. Here, Sharif Bissouini discusses some of the great advantages the Nuremberg prosecutors had as they put together their case. The German army was unique in terms of its discipline and in terms of its paperwork. You had five copies of every instrument. There was a paper trail. You had to follow the paper trail. There were tons of papers and documents that were presented at the trial. So you had the evidence. Second, you had about a million soldiers that occupied Germany. You had everybody at your disposal. You could question anybody. You could go anywhere you wanted. You could get any evidence you wanted. Welcome back. We return to the filmed evidence presented by the prosecution in its effort to show that the Nazis conspired to carry out an aggressive war. Part 4, Wars of Aggression, 1939 
1944. Invasion of Danzig, 1 September 1939. Under the stress of greatest threats on part of Poland, Danzig declares her independence on the 1st of September, 1939. For the first time, the swastika flags are waving from the official buildings in Danzig. Danger. Stop. Shooting going on. There is still a Polish office building in town where armed guerrillas have dug in. Under the protection of an armored car, men of the Danzig Home Guard smoke out this dangerous hiding place. Invasion of Poland, 1 September 1939. During the night, Poland, with regular troops, is fired for the first time on our territory. Since 5.45 a.m., we have been shooting back. Thus one removes borders with which the apostles of hate from Versailles believe to be able to separate fellow Germans from the German Reich. Discusses invasion of Poland. Bilder von höchster Eindringlichkeit vermitteln in diesem. The most impressive pictures in this film display to the German people the tremendous impact of the Polish war, especially the activity of our Luftwaffe. Once, when at Versailles, this beautiful weapon was taken away from us, one did not anticipate that this weapon would rise again under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, newer, stronger, and more potent. The things the Luftwaffe promised in Poland, this Luftwaffe is going to keep in England and in France. In England and Frankreich, halten. The fight, a vierwürdigen Feind, treffen, schlagen und vernichten. Invasion of Norway and Denmark, 9 April 1940. In den Morgenstunden des 9. April landeten in zahlreichen Häfen Norwegens und Dänemarks German troops landed in numerous ports of Norway and Denmark, an accomplishment without equal in the history of naval warfare. Hier Truppentransportschiffe bei der Einfahrt in den kleinen Welt. On the 22nd of June, 1850 hours, German summertime, the German-French armistice was signed in the forest of Compiègne. 
Of deutsche Seite als Beauftragter des Führers des obersten Befehlshabers der General Keitel, the chief of the high command, signed as the representative of the Führer. General Hunsinger signed as the representative of the French government. Sechs Stunden nach der Annahme Six hours after the acceptance of the Italian armistice conditions, the armistice became effective in France on the 25th of June. After the declaration of surrender by General Patin, General Keitel presents for signature an invitation for the Duce to come to Munich. An historic victory has been won. The armies of France have been destroyed. You can see here that uh, something was going on in the trial of the 22 defendants in this first uh, war crimes trial at Nuremberg. Something was going on beyond simply the guilt or innocent of these 22 defendants. Clearly, the prosecution was attempting to set a tone, a world tone, and uh, also a tone with regard to the, the people who would be judging various other defendants with regard to many others who might have been connected to the Nazi atrocities. Uh, Walter Rockler was a part of that. He went there after this first trial, 26-year-old young lawyer. And uh, to what extent is, did what we see here, to what extent was that uh, atmosphere and that whole theory replicated in what you were doing? Oh, it was carried. Uh, there were 12 more trials at Nuremberg before American tribunals, uh, which treated the judgment of the IMT. This trial. The big, this trial, the big case, as uh, a Bible for subsequent cases. We were all fundamentalists. Uh, you, Bible in the sense that certain underlying premises had been proven. Right. And, uh, and then certain could... positions of law had mm -hmm. been uh, established which could be applied to other facts. All right. Now, how many defendants then were brought in your part, the American part, that you were part of after this uh, international military tribunal trial? I would say roughly 270, mm -hmm. give or take. And uh, there was an interesting phenomenon that t took place, and that was that you were doing pretty well at the start getting convictions. And as time separated you both from the war itself and from some of the events we're seeing here, you started to lose some cases. Yes, well, the whole climate of international affairs changed. Uh, with the passing of time, by 1948, you had the Berlin airlift in which the Americans were bringing stuff into the city of Berlin strictly by plane. Uh, the Cold War was constantly intensifying, and the Germans exploited that to the hilt at the trials. Uh, the same feeling was felt to some degree by the American judges who were sitting on these cases. Uh, they became a little bit more sympathetic to the Germans and decidedly less sympathetic to our wartime allies. All of these were factors which played on it, added to which the, mat the matters dragged on for a long, long time. We're talking about four years of trials. Mm -hmm. The original trial took one year, and the subsequent proceedings added another three years. Walter, uh, Court TV had plans to present to our viewers at about this time, really, the first of the second round, really, of these war crimes trials was going to be in The Hague of uh, growing out of alleged atrocities and war crimes in the former Yugoslavia, the wars that have gone on there. Mm -hmm. Now, based on your experience, uh, well, you, you, there may be something in, the, in view of the fact that the, that trial has been put off. We're going to cover it if, it if it happens in the spring, as they say. What do you think is happening there? Well, I think they're still collecting evidence, and uh, there are all kinds of contradictions between political factors and yeah. judicial factors. I have uh, some regard and respect for the chief prosecutor there, who I think is uh, Richard Goldstone of South Africa. Uh, his problem is uh, that to a certain extent he's, he's at odds with the political considerations which bring together people that he might otherwise want to indict. Uh, or if you indict them, how do you then negotiate with them? Uh, 
for a while I thought that he was being victimized by the Western press, which has painted the Serbs as devils with horns as compared with the innocents, Croats, and Muslims, a view that I don't share. Mm -hmm. uh, but I notice in today's paper that he's proposing to indict some six or eight uh, Croat uh, leaders, and uh, that gives me more confidence in what's going on there. Okay. Uh, but for now, we're going to have to take a break and see how the prosecutors even confronted these defendants with evidence of the Japanese attack of the United States on the United States at Pearl Harbor. There were critics among the prosecutors at Nuremberg of the American charge that the Nazis conspired to carry out a war of aggression. The criticism was that there was ample evidence that the Nazis did indeed carry out a war of aggression. So why worry about the conspiracy? As the prosecutors continue with their filmed evidence of a plan, it increasingly shows, as we shall see, the plan actually being carried out. Invasion of USSR, 22nd June, 1941. in East Prussia. Away with the border gate. stubbornly defended by Siberian sharpshooters. A visit to a camp near Minsk. Declaration of War on the United States, 11 December, 1941. On 11 December, three days after the beginning of the war between Japan and the USA, the Fuhrer before the Reichstag spoke to the German people, the Italian and Japanese ambassadors. historic significance, the Fuhrer first reviewed the course of the war against Bolshevism. In doing so, he honored the heroism of our soldiers, their accomplishments, hardships, and efforts, which the homeland is hardly able to appreciate. In the second part of his speech, he mercilessly settled accounts with the warmonger and hypocrite Franklin Roosevelt. Side by side with Japan, Germany and Italy have now decided to conduct the fight for the defense of freedom and independence of their peoples and their countries against the United States of America and England. And that's the conclusion of our presentation of the presentation 
by the prosecutors at Nuremberg, the American prosecutors, of this film called The Nazi Plan, an effort to show the roots of the war of aggression that went way back into the early origins of the Nazi party. Now, Walter Rockler, in hindsight, what do you make of this strategy? Would you do it again if you were in a position to make the decision? Well, in terms, in terms of developing from an early stage of the Nazi party, the, the movement towards actual war, yeah, I would do that. I'm not so sure I would uh, wrap it all up in a conspiracy. Yeah. I think the same evidence might have come in without a conspiracy. Yeah. And they could have used that just to prove that, not that they planned to do it, but that they did it. On the other hand, I don't see the conspiracy, which I am not so fond of, yeah. uh, did any damage because yeah. the court didn't seem to pay much attention to it. <laughs> All right, now, we're going to take a break now, and as we do, U.S. Prosecutor Drexel Spreckler uh, reflects on the extraordinary presence of four separate prosecution teams at Nuremberg. The relations with both the French and the Soviets were not that close that you could uh, work things out very well. Had there been one overall uh, chief prosecutor who could have pulled things together, it would have saved a lot of time, and there wouldn't have been as much uh, repetition. Coming up tomorrow, a former prisoner offers eyewitness testimony about the German concentration camps. On the previous day, the gas supply had run out, and they had thrown the children into the furnaces alive. And... Hermann Goering, the highest ranking Nazi tried at Nuremberg, takes a stand. All that and more tomorrow on the Nuremberg Trial. The Nuremberg Trial was, of course, an international trial. And after the United States and Great Britain had made their opening statements and presented evidence, the French took over. They shared presentation of counts three and four with the Soviets. The French had suffered greatly during the war, although under the German-run Vichy government, France had also supported Hitler's great crimes. Francois de Manteau was the chief uh, prosecutor at the time he delivered his country's opening statement for the French, but he soon left the trial and turned the job over to Auguste Champitea de Rive. The new prosecutor was one of the few members of the French cabinet who had opposed yielding to Hitler's demands and he became a member of the French resistance. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur les Juges. The conscience of the peoples who only yesterday were enslaved and tortured, both in soul and body, calls upon you to judge and to condemn the most monstrous attempt at domination and barbarism of all times, both in the persons of some of those who bear the chief responsibility and in the collective groups and organizations which were the essential instruments of their crimes. France invaded twice in 30 years in the course of wars, both of which were launched by German imperialism, bore almost alone in May and June of 1940 the weight of armaments accumulated by Nazi Germany over a period of years in a spirit of aggression although temporarily crushed by superiority in numbers, material, and preparation, my country never gave up the battle for freedom and was at no time absent from the field. The engagements undertaken and the will for national independence would have sufficed to keep France behind General de Gaulle in the camp of the democratic nations. I propose today to prove to you that all this organized and vast criminality springs from what I may be allowed to call a crime against the spirit. I mean a doctrine that, denying all spiritual, rational, or moral values by which the nations have tried for thousands of years to improve human conditions, aims to plunge humanity back into barbarism, no longer the natural and spontaneous barbarism of primitive nations, but into a diabolical barbarism, conscious of itself and utilizing for its ends all material means put at the disposal of mankind by contemporary science. This sin against the spirit is the original sin of national socialism from which all crimes spring. This monstrous doctrine is that of racialism. 
the German race, composed in theory of Aryans, would be a fundamental and natural concept. Germans as individuals do not exist and cannot justify their existence, except insofar as they belong to the race or Volkstum, to the popular mass which represents and amalgamates all Germans. Race is the matrix of the German people. Proceeding therefrom, this people lives and develops as an organism. The German may consider himself only as a healthy and vigorous member of this body, fulfilling within the collectivity a definite technical function. His activity and his usefulness are the exact gauge and justification of his liberty. This national body must be molded to prepare it for a permanent struggle. The ideas and the bodily symbols of racialism form an integral part of its political system. This is what is called authoritative or dictatorial biology. The dictatorial regime instituted by Hitler and his companions carries with it for all Germans the soldier life, that is to say, a kind and a system of life entirely different from that of the bourgeois West and the proletarian East. It amounted to a permanent and complete mobilization of individual and collective energies. This integral militarization presupposed complete uniformity of thoughts and actions. It is a militarization that conforms to the Prussian tradition of discipline. Now it appears on the surface here that the French participation in these war crimes trials was disproportionate. Uh, to a certain degree, you had the Americans had one count, they prosecuted. Uh, the British had count two, they prosecuted. And then the French and the Soviets in tandem prosecuted the other two counts, three and four. Now, Walter Rockler, uh, how substantial was the, the French participation here? Well, compared to the American and British, I would say it was uh, decidedly a lesser participation and focused to some degree on offenses against France as distinguished uh, from uh, general German offenses in all directions. Uh, to some degree, that was also true for the Russians, but the Russians had a little bit more passion about it because they had lost about 20 million people during the war. And uh, at the end of the war, they really were not enthusiastic about either Germans or Nazis. Well, so what we've seen here is in the presentation by the Americans, it's a sort of a broad look at this total Nazi criminal conspiracy. But you're saying that when the French and the Russian turn came up, the French concentrated on crimes against French people in France and the Russians against crimes against Russians in the Soviet Union. Yeah, of course the Russian crimes were enormous because the Soviet Union was enormous. Yeah. And uh, the number of people involved was great. Now, the, the Soviet interest, uh, it was what you say, I mean, they, uh, they had lost 20 million people, a good number of them civilians. Uh, but their war crimes, the focus of their crimes, uh, sometimes had an ideological thrust, didn't it? Oh yeah, this wasn't, uh, this wasn't, in theory at least, the German people. This were their, this was their capitalist and imperialist masters who had mm -hmm. brought them to the sorry pass. And so, it, perhaps they may have been more vigorous, let's say, in prosecuting certain people who might be considered part of the capitalist class than maybe someone who might be considered more amenable to communism. I don't think they even needed the war for that. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you were in Connecticut, uh, you mentioned uh, recently uh, the service there having to do with the, the commemoration of the late Senator Thomas Dodd's participation. President Clinton made a talk there in which he suggested that the Americans would uh, would support a permanent war crimes tribunal, I presume such as this. Is that a good idea? Well, I think it's a good idea. I think it, in, in uh, the last year or two, we've seen the establishment of two ad hoc criminal courts, one for Rwanda and the other for Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, you're going to get all kinds of charges of bias when you create a court specially for a uh -huh. situation. I think a permanent <laughs> court would serve everybody's interests best as a sitting court at all times, just as you do not develop an American court every time there's a crime. Mm -hmm. um, if you had a sitting court there, it seems to me that there are so many things that happen around the world. You mentioned Rwanda, uh, in which people could say, hey, war crimes. If you had a 
a permanent place you could go. That's right. That's both the plus and the minus side of it. You uh, might get an awful lot of accusations against an awful lot of countries. Listen, I'm going to thank you very much. Our time's about up. We appreciate you being with us. I enjoyed being here. But uh, thank you for joining us for this first presentation ever of the Nuremberg War Crimes Trial in the long form, tracing the way they actually happened. Please do join us again tomorrow evening for another three-hour presentation starting at 5 o'clock Eastern Time as we turn to some of the dramatic eyewitness testimony against the defendants at Nuremberg. As for now, stay tuned for Primetime Justice with anchor Terry Moran after these messages.